does that song from the 80s go? What has my MCU done for me lately? Or something like that? Well, the answer is probably a lot. We're expecting a whole bunch from our MCUs these days. They're controlling our motors, monitoring our motion sensors, blinking our LEDs, of course, making our espresso come out perfect, controlling our homes, and probably will soon start to complain about doing the windows. <laughs> but, shh, don't tell them this. We're going to need a lot more from them moving forward. First, that security of theirs has got to tighten up. That horsepower is going to need to speed up. And that energy consumption, ugh, don't even get me started. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Whether they like it or not, our MCUs are going to have to start working a whole lot harder and smarter. My guest today is Chris Artis from Maxim Integrated, and we're talking about Maxim's new line of Darwin low-power microcontrollers that's going to push the evolution of the MCU forward yet again. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about the Darwin low-power microcontroller line from Maxim Integrated. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for talking to me today. Okay, so clearly the things from IoT are taking over. And let's face it, we're going to need better MCUs than what we've seen so far. So, Chris... What have you got for me? So we've recently introduced a family of products that we call Darwin. It's a series of low-power microcontrollers that have really been designed with the IoT in mind. They do a lot of things for us. You know, they bring security, they bring low power to the game, so they help you withstand attacks from hackers, help you make your device last longer in the field. Not just that, but they're also built to be smarter, to help you make your things smarter and actually just provide more value. And when you're designing something, you've got a return on investment in mind. If it gets thrown away in six months, there's not a lot of return on your investment. If it lasts in the field, you know, consumers are going to be more excited about buying the thing. Absolutely. Now, outlasts, that means battery life and power consumption to me. Absolutely. And that's really critical when you think about the real promise of the things and giving intelligence to all the things around us. Not a lot of them are close to a wall socket. Not a lot of them get a direct line to the energy company. So you got to think about batteries. You got to think about alternate energy sources, and those are all constrained. You don't really want the car battery attached to all these things. So we've designed these parts to be low power in every mode that you can think of. You can think of like a temperature sensor or something like that. It doesn't need to monitor a temperature all the time. It just wakes up every once in a while to do that. So we worry about sleep mode. We worry about what our micro is doing when it's active. We worry about how much horsepower do we need to throw at a certain job. So we've really taken a lot of time to design these things to give developers a lot of knobs to turn on power. Excellent. Now, Chris, my thing can't be some boat anchor that I have to drag around 24-7, right? What are you doing about form factor? We uh, look at things that we can integrate into our parts to make them a little bit easier and make them in tighter form factors. We go into a lot of things like wearable fitness devices, and you can imagine you don't want to wear a boat anchor on your wrist. It would right. probably cause some problems. <laughs> you would. <laughs> And so yeah, we'll do things like try to help you get rid of level translators. We can output a couple of different voltages on our I.O. pins. So yeah, it helps you save some space. We've got some smarter clocking options, so you don't need a lot of external circuitry for that. So we've done a lot of things to make sure that you don't need a whole lot else on the outside to have a pretty smart system. Okay, and so things like this have to be smart, right? And that requires horsepower. Now, what kind of processing power are we really talking about here? So we've got pretty powerful processors in these things. They're Cortex-M4Fs, which means that they have some DSP capability and some floating point capability. Now, what that really means is that these processors can run more advanced algorithms, and they can do it pretty power efficiently. A lot of algorithms that do things like take raw heart rate data and figure out what your heart rate is or you know, look at your blood oxygen level, things like that, they need those DSP and floating point capabilities in order to do the job efficiently. Sure. Okay, Chris, I'm worried about my thing getting hacked. 
what are you doing about security for me and my design? Oh, you should always worry about your thing getting hacked. And one of the things we see is that people don't worry about that until it's too late. Right. And so we try to provide developers with the tools to do it right from the outset. We've got a lot of great security technology from being in things like ATMs and credit card terminals for a long time. And we've taken a lot of that technology into these parts so you can encrypt data, you can protect your software, you can do all kinds of things to make sure that your device isn't on the news or at the next Black Hat conference. Good. Okay, so let's talk about some specifics about devices and packages. All right, so we've got a pretty nice family of products now, and they're all Cortex-M4F, like I mentioned, 100 megahertz-ish type parts. And we've got a bunch of devices today, the three bubbles you see there in the middle, that are out in the field. They're very popular and wearable fitness devices. You can see some YouTube teardowns showing them in there. More recently, we've released parts that are kind of the bookends to the family. So you can see the guy at the top there is 3 megabytes flash, 120 megahertz. That's a pretty beefy processor with a lot of peripherals. And then you see the one there at the bottom, which is the complete opposite, probably the smallest Cortex M4F device available on the market today. Cool. All right. So let's talk a little more. So the Max 32660. Yes, it's the smallest ARM Cortex M4F. Yeah, I'm not sure I've researched that at 100%, but I'm pretty darn sure about that. It's in a wafer level package. It's 1.6 millimeters on a side. And you can see kind of how big that is next to Ape Lincoln there. Yeah. Even when you put it in a piece of plastic like a TQFN package, you're still talking about something that's pretty tiny. So this thing can fit anywhere and it's a pretty powerful processor that you can attach to lots of things. When you think about tiny, you think about 8-bit or 16-bit slow processors with not a lot of memory. That's not what this is. You can add real intelligence to things with this device. Okay, so Chris, what's under the hood in one of these new MCUs? So this one, the Max 32660, it's actually pretty simple under the hood. It's got a few peripherals. It's got 14 GPIO, so you're not talking about driving a whole lot of stuff externally. But what's nice inside is you've got 256K of flash and 96K of SRAM, which when you think about tiny, that's not tiny. That's actually pretty beefy. Then you've got the powerful core, so you can run algorithms and things like that. So you've got a, a very powerful processor with just enough I.O. to interact with the world around it, read a sensor, maybe control something, and, and do some pretty intelligent things. Excellent. So what do I get with this tiny MCU? Does it still have enough capabilities? For sure. It's got plenty of capabilities. You're talking about a 100 megahertz part that can run that powerful algorithms. 256K of code is plenty of space for doing all sorts of neat things. But it's not going to drain your battery either. You've got some options for power consumption. If you only need 24 megahertz of horsepower, you can dial down the voltage and get better power performance. If you need the full 100 megahertz, you dial up the voltage a little bit. You get a little bit worse, but still really good power performance. That's on the active side. When you go to sleep, you can remember all those contents of memory for just a few microwatts. So this thing can last forever on a battery. This thing can make that R in the ROI really work out in your favor. Okay, Chris, what on earth are people using this for? I mean, tiny doesn't necessarily mean good. Tiny doesn't always mean good, but this is finding its way into all kinds of interesting places. Cool. We first built it to help make sensors more intelligent. We've also got a line of things like heart rate sensors and SpO2 sensors in the company. And we worked with that group to build this part because those sensors, they just kind of spew out a raw stream of data that's not horribly useful as it is. It needs some coaxing. It needs some processing to get a real heart rate out or get real useful data. Sure. So what this device sitting next to one of those sensors can do is you could put that algorithm there and have you know a nice black box solution for building a more intelligent sensor. It takes a lot of the work away from the engineer who either buy the raw sensor and figure out what the heck do I do with all this data or they buy the intelligent sensor that just gives you a heart rate and they can go build whatever other interesting thing they were building. Yeah. Another interesting use case that we kind of discovered once we started talking to customers about this is as an upgrade path for existing 8-bit and 16-bit microcontrollers. We see all kinds of stuff wanting to get smarter. Think about the fitness watches I mentioned earlier. A few years ago, they told you how far you went and they showed you the time. And right. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. And today, you can get your altitude. You've got a nice color display. They connect to your phone. You could probably tweet about what you just did. Undoubtedly. <laughs> it's, it's too much, right? But it, right. everything is getting smarter like that. And so we see applications where the 16-bit micro that somebody's using today just doesn't have the juice to be smarter, to 
make better decisions to process more data. And this thing is small. It's low power. It's comparable power. It's comparable cost. So we see a lot of people looking at this as a replacement. And then we see people using this for really making a nice architecture for low power system. Okay, low power. That's always intriguing. Let's talk more about that. Yeah, so what we see is when you've got a big processor doing pretty beefy tasks, you know, something like a microprocessor, it consumes probably watts of power. It probably even gets pretty hot. Yeah. You don't necessarily want that processor waking up to service a sensor, especially if, for example, one of the sensors is being used to figure out when should I actually wake up the whole system and start consuming a lot of power. Yeah. Just think about like a motion camera or something like that. You don't want the big processor waking up all the time, monitoring the motion sensor, and then firing up the camera. Right. You would rather have this low power microcontroller monitoring all those sensor inputs and then saying, hey, big guy, it's time to wake up and go do your work. Okay, so once I fire up the application processor, I'm still in high power land, right? Is there any hope on that front? Yeah, yes and no. So it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're doing video processing, you're probably going to create some heat and burn some power. But we see actually a bunch of applications where you have a high powered processor but it's really being underutilized. And so we kind of saw this space where you're somewhere between a low power embedded processor and a high powered microprocessor. And that's actually the other part that I mentioned earlier, kind of on the high end of the microcontroller side. That's a Max 32650. And so it's a Cortex M4F. It runs at 120 megahertz. Got a whole bunch of memory, three megabytes of flash, a megabyte of SRAM. But it's got the power performance of a low power embedded microcontroller. And it kind of starts to scratch at the horsepower and memory capabilities of an application processor. Nice. So we see people who have done things like they start with a Raspberry Pi because it's easy. Yeah. There's no harm in doing that, especially from a prototyping perspective. But then they put their sensor out in the field and they have to attach that car battery to it. To right. Make it last and yeah. it weighs 20 pounds and you know as long as they're not using the full horsepower of that we can offer them a path to having something much lower cost lighter much smaller all those nice things very cool chris so what's inside one of these so this is a bit beefier than the processor we talked about earlier yeah uh, it's got the same core inside runs a little bit faster much more memory it's got a whole bunch of security engines in it you can do things like elliptic curve crypto you can protect your data with aes there's a whole lot of ways to protect data you've got a lot of high speed communication interfaces, SPI, quad SPI, USB high speed. You've also got ways to access external memory. I said we've got three megabytes of flash and one megabyte of SRAM, and I hate to be like somebody else who said, well, nobody will ever need more memory than that. So you know, we put ways to access external memories, Hyperbus, Accelibus, quad SPI. So ways for applications to grow beyond. And really, that's kind of where we start to scratch into that microprocessor space. Cool. Okay. So Chris, walk me through the features and the benefits, you know, the big picture for this guy. So we're still talking about a pretty low power processor, about 100 microwatts per megahertz when it's active. That means you can actually work it into even high-end wearable devices and still get power benefits compared to what else is out there in the market. You still got very low retention power. You can actually turn the knob on this part of how much of that one megabyte of SRAM do you want to retain. More SRAM means more leakage, so we give you a bunch of options. How much SRAM do you want to remember when you go to sleep? You know, lots of high-speed peripherals. We see this thing being pretty useful in things like a remote data collection. You've got an SD card controller, so you can you know, put the sensor out in the field for years, have it write its data to an SD card, and then you've got a high-speed path through the USB high speed to get that data off. So pretty versatile, powerful microcontroller. Okay, so quick question, Chris. Maxim isn't really known for being in this space, right? No, we're not really known for being in the microcontroller space, but we've been doing it for over 20 years. We've got a big background in secure microcontrollers, in some other low-power spaces as well, but over the last several years, we've been working on this family of products that gets more into wearables, gets into IoT sensors and things like that. So while we're not necessarily well known, you know, we are using industry standard tools, things like Eclipse and Embed. We've got some support on Arduino. So you know, I think developers will be pretty familiar with the tools that we're supported by. They're obviously familiar with the ARM Cortex cores. So we've positioned these parts to give designers what they need to really build the next generation of smarter and secure IoT devices. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining joining me, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find more information about Maxim Integrated's new line of Darwin Low Power Microcontrollers. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.